The day had started much like any other for Charles Peckham. He and his friend Harry were ploughing up by Burlow Castle near Arlington in East Sussex, a location that inspired much fear amongst the local kids due to old wives' tales about strange goings on at night. But Charles and Harry were ploughmen and went about their ploughing, taking no heed of spooky old stories. It was at noon when the men stopped to take their lunch that Charles first heard a sound from the hedgerow. It sounded just like a small voice asking for help. Harry quickly assured him that it was merely the midday sun and lack of lunch that had Charles hearing things. And with that, Harry went away to tuck into his lunch. But Charles once again heard a panicked squeak. Help! Help! Charles dropped to all fours and whispered into the hedge. What's the matter? A small voice replied, I've broken my bread peel and I need to keep everyone fed. A peel, by the way, is the flat wooden paddle used for putting bread in an oven. But Charles wasn't one to ask too many questions, so he leaned into the hedge to take the peel. Charles almost jumped out of his skin as he heard a great rumbling and a crack appeared in the earth to his side, and from that was thrust the bread peel. But once he saw the size of the thing, he had to catch himself before letting out a laugh. What was this person baking? Breadcrumbs? But Charles suspected it belonged to one of the fairies that appeared near the castle, and you simply do not laugh at fairies. Looking at the utensil, Charles realised he'd have to improvise, so he fished around for the tin tack in his pocket, and using his knee as a bench and the end of his lunch knife as a hammer, he fastened the peel back together. Good as new! So he posted it back through the small crack in the earth. Charles couldn't wait to tell Harry. He knew that would cheer the grumpy old bugger up. Oh, Charlie Packham met a fairy! Can you believe it? But Harry was hardly impressed. Did you not hear the parish clerk the other day? He explained all that stuff and nonsense. Fairies don't exist. Now let's get back to work. And so they did. The following day, Harry and Charles continued their job at Arlington, pointedly not speaking about the incident the previous day. Lunchtime came around and Charles once again heard a little voice from the hedge. Come, come. Sitting next to the crack in the earth was a small, finely worked bowl with a chestnut-coloured liquid inside. Carefully picking it up, the most glorious scent reached Charles's nose. Beer! But not just regular old beer, it smelt rich and complex. He tasted it. <gasps> Even better than the smell! Charles gulped it down in a moment of pure sensory euphoria. Charles realised that he should have left a little bit to give to Harry, so that he could also experience the best beer the world had ever known but figured he could at least show his buddy the little bowl. That would prove he'd met a fairy. In his excitement though, Charles let the bowl slip from his fingers and it smashed to bits on the ground. But that's okay, he could still show him the fragments. Harry could smell beer on Charles's breath and barely even looked at the cracked pieces of pottery in his colleague's hands. He refused to say another word. Instead, spent the afternoon passive-aggressively ploughing and making plans to find a new partner, one who wasn't a drunkard. As the day wore on, though, Harry began to feel under the weather. A rare feeling for a hearty Sussex man such as himself. Once home, Harry found himself feeling too weak to stand, so he put himself to bed. He awoke in a blurry haze the next morning, feeling even worse than the day before. Then looking down at his arms, he could see they looked like mere skin and bone. His wife fetched the doctor, and the doctor fetched the priest, but despite their best efforts, he had wasted away to nothing. Harry was declared dead at 12 noon, the exact time that he had declined to help the fairy two days earlier. And this story lived on, until it was described by William Fowington about his great-grandfather, Charles Packham, to the antiquarian M. A. Lower in 1854, explaining the reason why he and his friends were still too scared to approach Burlow Castle in the dark. Welcome, one and all, and let me tell you a tale of gods and goblins. A podcast exploring the bizarre world of British mythology, folklore, and fairy tales. We will share tales of fearsome giants, valiant heroes, witches and wizards, ghosts and ghouls, curious plants and curious animals. But in this, 
our inaugural series. We're taking a look at one of the most prevalent creatures that was said to inhabit the British Isles, the fairies. Fairies have taken various forms, from industrious, if mischievous, we folk, to cruel and vengeful wielders of magic, with many tales falling somewhere between the two. They're all beer and bread paddles until you piss them off, like Harry in our opening story. They've gone from beings more powerful than any mortal to cute tinkerbells frolicking at the bottom of the garden. But one thing is for sure, tales of fairies have fascinated and frightened British folk in equal measure. But first, let's do our introductions. My name is Heather Morehouse, your humble narrator. You may know me as Makeup Mouse uh, on the internet, maybe. I don't know. I do makeup. I am an enthusiastic amateur, so please do not expect academic level research here. This is all a bit of fun. And I am joined by Kieran Hill, my co-writer, my co-creator, and my co-pilot in the flight of life. Would you like to introduce yourself, Kieran? Yeah. Ahoy, Captain. Happy to be here. I'm not a pilot. No, but you are sitting by my left. Is that where the co-pilot would sit? I, I, can, can I be the person with the serving trolley? That's probably wise. <laughs> You can be the one that dishes out the microwaved sandwiches. Yes. But before we learn about fairies, let's introduce the podcast itself, the types of stories to expect, and how they are collected. For the time being, we'll be talking about the mythology of the British Isles. England, Scotland, Wales and Ireland will be included in it as well. We may go further afield at some stage, but we wanted to start with the stories of a culture that we're already familiar with. I grew up in Sussex, whoop whoop, and Kieran in Oxfordshire. You just stolen my water. Uh, yes, I need it more than you. So we've known some of these stories since childhood. We've come into this project sometimes with our own more localised versions of classic tales and some stories linked specifically to the counties that we grew up in, which we will certainly be regaling you with as the podcast progresses. But upon researching this podcast, we've also come across an incredible range of variants on the stories that we already knew, and loads more stories that are completely new to us and are really great. And one of the exciting things is that there's such diversity in these stories, but also a great deal of common threads and motifs as well. So rather than taking a really wide look at global mythology, where we may miss a lot of the significance of the different cultural touchstones in those stories, we're going to take a closer look at what already surrounds us. Plus, a load of these stories are just cool and interesting and weird, and we wanted to share them with the wider world. So that's what we're doing. Some stories that make up what we call a mythology of Britain are old, some are more recent, and they come from all sorts of sources. They vary from region to region, as stories tend to do when passed down through the generations, with each storyteller imbuing the lore with their own spin and experience. The older stories tend to be particularly grim, they're often pretty crude, and as such are pretty fun. Potentially they're a representation of the harshness and cruelty of the times, with the later ones often cleaned up a bit for polite society, and given more of a spin towards children, so less of the murdering and pillaging. But this is why no telling of a folktale can be right or wrong, because it's an ever-changing representation of the beliefs and traditions of the folk in question. You might even recognise some of these stories that we bring up and have your own localised spin on them, and we would love to hear the variants that you're familiar with if you'd like to get in touch with us. You can even email us on our wonderful email address, which goes as follows. Would you like to re- tell yeah, us, Kieran? Really you'd like me to tell it? It's <laughs> godgobpod at gmail.com. That's godgobpod at gmail.com. There are various ways that these stories are told, too. Poems, songs, dances, customs, special days, children's stories, and even personal anecdotes. The difficult thing is that the ways that these have been recorded can often be flawed or at least incomplete. Early folklore has been pieced together from the manuscripts that have survived through the years, but many have been entirely lost to time. Many accounts that we have now were recorded by scholars during the boom in folklore study in the Victorian era, And these were often the account of one particular person who was recounting the story from memory, written down by hand, and likely filtered through the personal interpretations of that particular scholar. So we can only imagine the amount of stories that have been lost entirely, meeting folkloric dead ends with nobody there to hear them and pass them on. What draws me personally to folklore is that it's a history of people, 
not kings and clergy, but the regular, normal people who came before us, their fears and their imagination. And these people often lived hard lives, working the land, dealing with illness, birth and death, without many of the scientific advancements that we take for granted. So these myths and traditions filled some important roles. They provided some much needed entertainment, sometimes they explained natural phenomena, and they provided a sense of group identity, as well as scratching that itch of curiosity that makes us human. We just can't let a question go unanswered, and if the answer is a good story, then all the better for it. And the fact that many of these stories have lived on suggests that we can hopefully still gain something interesting from them. So that's why we're talking about all this. Now, let's actually get into it. Well, language is significant, so first, let's step over to Dictionary Corner to talk about the origin and meaning of the word fairy to get an idea of what it meant to people. Dictionary, Dictionary Corner. Oh, she had a Casio keyboard. Oh, well, you've already got a synth, so. Yeah, it was in, it didn't have it was DJ. 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 Di di dictionary Corner. Yeah, we definitely need a little jingle, though. The origin of the word fairy comes from the Latin fatum, to enchant, which entered French as fay or fairy, meaning an illusion. And then it came into Middle English as early as the year 900 as fay, and later around 1250 to 1300 as fairy. In Scots, the word fay can mean appearing to be under a spell or marked by an apprehension of death, calamity or evil. In this sense, it may also be linked to the idea of fate, or the fates, from classical mythology, with fey also meaning doomed or fated to die in older British dialects. In Old French Romance, a fey was also a woman skilled in magic who knew the power and virtue of words, stones and herbs. Which is very me. <laughs> I love stones. You do know the value of a stone. I know the exact value of a stone. <laughs> Remarkable, just watching you go out in the yard and pick up stones. 18 pence. <laughs> Trying to do cattle auctions with various <laughs> pebbles that I've located. No takers yet. In a lot of the mythology, fairies and witches are pretty linked, so uh, we might be talking about hags and witches and such wise women soon. Keep an eye out, or an ear out, as twere. <laughs> By the Middle Ages, the word fairy had several meanings, including enchantment itself, magic or illusion, the realm where enchanted beings dwelt, the country of the fays or fairyland, the supernatural inhabitants of fairyland as a whole, or an individual in fairyland, for example, the fairy knight, or an elf. So I suppose, realistically, they should be the same singular and plural, like sheep or fish. When belief in fairies was commonplace, the majority of people would be reluctant to talk about them at all, fearing it would bring them bad fortune. Instead, they'd be referred to euphemistically as the little people, good folk, wee folk, fair folk, people of peace, or the hidden people, in a sort of he-who-shall-not-be-named fashion. In Welsh, they were referred to as the Tilworth Teg, and in Scotland and Ireland, they were the Aes She, which all refer to the same sorts of creatures. So, fairy is a general term for any supernatural being from fairyland, and they definitely have some links to illusion or magic. But when it comes to a more thorough definition, we need to mention that fairies have meant different things to different people. Different eras, authors, regions and cultures have all given the fair folk their own spin. Many of these stories will contradict each other, but for sure we need to say goodbye first to Disney and those sorts of flower fairy illustrations which I don't know about you, but I bloody loved as a kid. Wow. That's probably where this all started. You know, the flower fairies. I do not know the flower fairies. Yeah, you do. Oh, the things you showed me like yesterday. Yes. <laughs> There's one that's Heather. That's my name. Is there one that's Kieran? No, because Kieran's not a flower or a plant. But anyway, the point is, uh, those fairies are irrelevant. What we're talking about is traditional British fairies, their traits and their attributes. You can stay tuned for episode two for a full rundown of some of the most common British fairies. That'll be very exciting. But first, these are the things that, at least within British folklore, hold true for fairies as a whole. They're generally proportioned like humans, but are smaller than people, ranging from under an inch to four feet tall. The smallest are said to be the Portunes, who are only half an inch high, and are also likely to be the oldest English fairies, described by an English historian nearly 800 years ago. Though also in older stories, some fairies are human-sized or even larger, so that makes things a little confusing with our first point. <laughs> Aren't human-sized fairies just humans? No, they're fairies. How do you know? Because of the following points. 
They frequently have the ability to change size or fully shapeshift. And when it comes to style, pink tutus, magic wands and butterfly wings are a pretty modern take on a fairy. They were usually represented in little jackets and caps in greens or reds, the colours of the landscape. Most fairies are hideously ugly, particularly the smaller common or household fairies, though there are some beautiful ones, the fairy aristocracy. Most common in Celtic Britain, particularly Scotland in the Middle Ages, fairy royalty are sometimes as large as humans, often dressed in bright colours and fond of processions and banquets. It's alright for some. And I say they bring nothing to the community. <laughs> we don't need fairy queens. <laughs> we need to start a fairy republic. <laughs> Typically in British folklore, the fairy is wingless. If they do take to the skies, they can be seen flying on the backs of birds, on stems of ragwort, which is a bright yellow daisy type flower, particularly worrying for many farmers in Britain due to its poisonous nature to cattle and horses. And sometimes they even fly on the back of tiny fairy horses. In Northumberland, there are tales of fairies dancing and playing at night, running on the backs of their little white horses with little fairy-sized saddles on them and leaving no footprints behind. It's said their tinkling bells could be heard for miles around. They're most commonly spotted at dawn and dusk, the in-between time, known as the gloaming, which comes from the old Germanic word for twilight, or midnight under a full moon. The days you're most likely to see them are Lady Day on the 25th of March, which is the Feast of the Annunciation. May Day, which is the 1st of May, Midsummer's Day on the 24th of June, Halloween on the 31st of October, and Christmas Day, the 25th of December. Christmas fairies, that's quite fun. Aww. Oh, I like that. The more human-friendly fairies are notorious for industriously working in the hours that us humans spend asleep. While varying wildly from benign to malevolent, the fairy is almost always mischievous and playful. They delight in singing and dancing in the moonlight and playing pranks on humans. Fairies will often return a kind favour that a human does for them, and will act fairly unless disrespected, at which time they will unleash some sort of magical punishment as recompense for the perceived slight, often in the form of a curse that will cause the mortal to wither away. Adding to their magic, fairies are often invisible to the human eye, or can turn invisible at will through their powers of glamour. Glamour in this sense meaning an enchantment or illusion, as we learned earlier being synonymous with the origin of the word fairy itself. Sometimes it is said that they are only visible in the twinkling of an eye, or in the moment between a blink. Though small in size, fairies are more powerful than mortals, often possessing inhuman strength and will almost always outwit a human. It is worth noting that while fairies naturally outlive humans, it is possible for a fairy to be killed, and as such they are not necessarily immortal in the manner of a mythological god, but more biologically immortal, a little like a two-legged tardigrade. Tardigrades are one of my favourite animals. Are they animals or insects? Anyway, they're these little chubby pig things that live in water and are very small and can withstand extremely high and extremely low temperatures and radiation. In fact, I would say that the mascot for this particular show is a small, blue, furry tardigrade that I hold in my hands presently. It's a toy. It's not a real tardigrade. They live in algae. This semi-immortality is also due to fairy and human time working differently. A visitor to fairyland may feel as though they've been away for hours, but have been asleep for years. Or alternatively, human time can pass extremely slowly for fairies, with a single moment being enough for a whole adventure to take place in their realm. The Victorian folklorist Thomas Cately categorised fairies as distinct from men and from the higher orders of divinities. So they're stronger than humans, but weaker than gods, and they're once again inhabiting that in-between space. They're closely connected to the natural world, and are particularly fond of animals, sometimes represented as guardians of nature, and fairy stories are often intermingled with those who work on the land or with livestock. The places that fairies live are also close to the natural world, generally living underground in mounds, but also underwater or in remote woodland. In Celtic myth, fairies will often live in or around particular trees, most commonly lone hawthorn trees, and as such, humans would often be reluctant to cut down these fairy trees, in case their wrath would be unleashed upon them. We'll be discussing the places that fairies live and their origins in a future episode, so stay tuned for that too! And what exactly do fairies do? Well, they're small and they're oversensitive, we understand that, but what makes them so special? 
What makes them special is the way that they choose to spend their time. And that can vary greatly depending on the particular fairy. The fairy fowl and the fairy fair. That's a very good pun that I didn't come up with. That was all Kieran. You sound like you're being incredibly disingenuous. No, I'm being very nice. Sounds like you're being very nice. <laughs> I genuinely, it was a good pun. I liked it. <laughs> I thought it was good. That's why I'm citing my sources in case anyone thinks that I'm very clever for making that very good pun. Thank you, Heather. It has been my sole contribution to this. Well, no. <laughs> Okay, so we know that fairies are consistently morally ambiguous, but the common or guardian fairies that are nicer to humans can often be found working after hours, threshing corn or wheat at great speed. I'll admit I don't know what threshing means, but I assume it's an important task. They're often looking after wildlife, particularly deer. They spend their Friday nights grooming the beards of goats before taking it easy and relaxing on Saturdays, which is the fairy Sabbath, according to one particular 19th century superstition. I would love to groom the beard of a goat one day. That's on my bucket list. Back to the fairies. They also often feed horses. They mend shoes, as we're probably familiar with in the tale of the elves and the shoemaker. They often complete tedious household chores, and they generally are upstanding members of society. And while a lot of these actions don't necessarily seem that exciting, for the people that lived off the land and believed in fairies, having your shoes mended or your horses fed overnight would be a pretty great thing. So, thanks fairies. But you can't expect all fairies to help you out with household tasks, and most fairies spend most of their lives ambivalent to human comings and goings, unless they need to reach out for help in a particular task. If fairies do cross paths with humans, they're for the most part kind and generous. However, should a human disrespect a fairy in any way whatsoever, they will revoke that kindness. And there are a lot of ways to offend a fairy, including, but not limited to, laughing at them, not believing in them, spying on them, intrusive questioning, telling fairy secrets, eavesdropping, in some tales also verbally thanking them for their good deeds, which is kind of a weird one. You'd have thought in any context being thanked for doing a nice thing would be nice, but not if you're a fairy. Trespassing in their domain, refusing to eat their food, or also calling them demons, which is probably the most reasonable one so far. But above all, fairies demand politeness, and people would have been aware of a code of fairy etiquette that was wise to adhere to in order to maintain good terms with the fairy folk. Folk customs and fairy tales were the means of communicating these rules regarding appropriate behaviour, and what to expect if these rules were broken. And we did kind of wonder why politeness was such a key aspect to a lot of these stories, but this particular list of qualities that fairies like to see in people, I think kind of explains it. So they like bright, gentle, loving personalities. Fairies will tend to focus their mischief or outright cruelty on people who are rude, bad-tempered, or selfish. They want people to be kind to each other, not engaging in unpleasant activities such as boasting or wife-beating. Bit of a difference between those two things, but sure. Fairies expect all questions to be answered politely. And they really like neatness and order in the home, such as a swept hearth and clean water on the go. So basically the rules for keeping fairies on your side, and probably the other people in your village, are to be nice, clean your room, and don't be horrible to your wife or others. Committing any of the aforementioned offences can incur the wrath of the fairies. Though diminutive, an offended or angered fairy is a force to be reckoned with. The following are some examples of what happens when a fairy's feelings are messed with, or if an unlucky mortal crosses paths with a fairy with cruel intentions. Fairies can take the goodness or essence from human food, for example, spoiling milk. They will blind people who spy on them. They'll steal from people or simply just steal people. They are particularly taken with stealing children, which they replace with fairy changelings or women who they force to work as their nurses or midwives. In many tales, this is due to fairies being somewhat infertile, either needing to take human children to raise as their own, or requiring human women more familiar with babies to take care of their fairy children if they are able to produce their own offspring. At times, these babies will be from fairy stock only, or through interbreeding with humans that they probably also stole. I reckon changelings deserve their own episode too, so stay tuned for that. Also, wow, we're promising a lot. Oh, it's gonna be grim. 
it is probably going to be pretty grim. However, these are not their only targets. Take, for example, Thomas the Rhymer. From Scottish legend, who was taken by the Queen of Elfland for seven years until he was granted the power of prophecy by the Queen. He was then returned to the human realm and was the greatest prophet and poet in the land, greater even than Merlin. Can you believe it? They can paralyse with elf shot or fairy stroke. Fairies would shoot cursed or toxic stone arrowheads at humans, causing a disease in them which modern interpretations suggest would have been a stroke. This folk belief grew up around the Neolithic flint arrowheads that have been found around Great Britain and parts of Europe. Many of these arrowheads, especially those known by archaeologists as birdshot, were small and finely worked, so people who found them attributed the handiwork to fairies. Not possibly being able to imagine that people could just make them themselves. <laughs> it's either us or God. I didn't make it. God didn't make it. Must be those fairies. In Scotland, it was once believed that those born with some sort of physical defect had an elf mark, which meant they were marked by fairies out of spite. In Shakespeare's Richard III, Queen Margaret called Richard thou elfish marked abortive rooting hog, which uh, I assume means she wasn't chuffed with him. Of course he didn't write it. <laughs> of course, of course he didn't write any of it because he wasn't rich enough to write good. Fairies are said to be most malevolent on the first three days of May, which starts with Beltane in the anglicised version of the pronunciation, or the Gaelic Bealtana? I think that's kind of correct, which is the Gaelic May Day Festival. Most commonly, it's held on the 1st of May, or about halfway between the spring equinox and the summer solstice. Thankfully, scattering primrose on the threshold of your home keeps the fairies away, as they cannot pass over this flower. However, that's not to say that fairies will always hold a grudge. Sometimes they just want you to listen to them. At Home on the Wolds, which is a village in Yorkshire, the humans decided to build a church. Classic human activity. The fairies told them to build it at the top of the hill, but the humans ignored that advice and thought, nah, we got this. They set about building it at the bottom of the hill. The fairies did not like that. So as soon as they completed the church, the fairies had come in and destroyed it. The humans tried building it again, still at the bottom of the hill, and found it destroyed once more. Third time lucky, the church was built at the top of the hill. And that's all the fairies wanted, frankly. They just wanted it at the top of the hill, and they allowed it to remain. Now, I tried to find evidence of this church, because I thought it would be really cool to, like, find a picture of the actual church at home on the walls that the fairies approved the building of. And not only could I not find this church, I couldn't find any hills whatsoever. It was the flattest place that I have ever seen in my life. I was looking at it on Google Street View, of course, I didn't actually visit it. So I called nincompoop on this. Nincompoop. Humbug. Not nincompoop. I call humbug upon ye, sir, you nincompoop. Yeah, that, 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 that's oh, it's a mangled n sentence, but a sentence not the <laughs> I call nincompoopery on this. <laughs> These may seem like tales from the deepest annals of time, but fairy belief continued in Britain until at least the late 19th or early 20th century, particularly in rural communities. Pretty much every town and county has its own collection of folk stories. While these folk beliefs had been dismissed by learned society as the superstitions of farmers and fisher folk, all wrapped up with some sort of devilish activity for hundreds of years, there suddenly started being an interest in all this in the Romantic era, which started around 1800. Folklore as a word didn't even exist until 1846, but as the study of fairies and other such folklore became popular with educated members of 19th century society, the belief even reached some of them. Even such noted figures as Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, amongst others, became believers in the fairies. We'll be touching on that in a future episode too. It's fun when farmers and fisher folk do it, but when Arthur Conan Doyle is like, fairies totally exist, blah, it just sounds stupid. He was a weirdo. In my home county of Sussex, fairy folklore was very much alive, if dwindling a little, at this point in time. Here, in fact, the word fairy morphed into Pharisee due to a weird element of the Sussex dialect that was still present in the 19th century of reduplicating plurals. There's a little poem that makes fun of the Sussex dialect that goes like this. I saw the ghostesses sitting on their postesses eating of the toastesses, fighting with their fistesses. And so fairies were called Pharisees, which gets confused with 
the Pharisees, Pharisees being a member of a Jewish religious party that flourished in Palestine during the latter part of the Second Temple period, and are not fairies at all. That you know of. That we know of. Da, 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 da. All copyrighted. Sussex fairies were considered hard workers, more than willing to help out farm works with such tasks as wheat threshing, and were known to get really uh, sweaty. Seriously, this shows up in a surprising amount of these Sussex fairy stories. They're just sweaty buggers. What are we going to do about it? Although they were industrious, they were prone to take offence if their work was questioned. Classic fairy. And as such, it was a seriously held thought that one should strive not to offend the fairy folk. The noted Sussex antiquarian M.A. Lower that appeared at the very top of this episode, who also founded the Sussex Archaeological Society, and is credited with the starting of the Cult of the Sussex Martyrs. More on those later? Maybe more on those later. (laughs) All I know is he did not enjoy the excesses of the Bonfire Boys. I don't know what those are either. I'm assuming something to do with Lewis Bonfire. Yes, almost certainly something to do with Lewis Bonfire Night. Either way, he collected several first-hand, second-hand, third-hand, and fourth-hand, really down-the-line accounts in some cases, from Sussex residents in 1854. Here is another one told by Fowington, which we will leave you with today. Fowington's wife's great-grandmother's brother not only saw some fairies, but he was also one of those who managed to offend them. His name was Jeems Meepen. Jeems. J-E-E-M-S. And based on the fact that Sussex people clearly couldn't talk, I'm assuming his actual name was James? But we have him called Jeems. And he was a farmer, which I guess you'd have to be if you're called Jeems. There must be so many people called Jeems right again. (laughs) My son's name is Bort. (laughs) (laughs) Jeems had a barn that stood out on its own a fair way away from anything. This was where he stored his wheat and oats for threshing. And when going to visit the barn one day, he noticed that the threshed pile was bigger than when he had left it. This happened a few more times. The pile kept being bigger in the morning than when he left it overnight. So, fearing neither man nor devil, as the saying goes, apparently, he figured he'd go over one night to figure out what was happening. Never mind that someone was coming into his barn and doing his work for him. The important thing is that it was trespassing. So he finished his dinner and marched up to the solitary barn as the sun was setting and hid out behind a hay bale to keep watch. The hours passed and eventually it had gone midnight. It was getting really cold and he had to be up at dawn to get to work on the farm. Jeems was just about to head home when a few small men, about 18 inches high, snuck in under the door and began threshing his wheat at a hem of a rate. That means really fast. He had never seen anything like it. Jeems would perhaps have been frightened had they not been quite so small. What strange little folk. He got the giggles, but managed to keep from giving himself away by stuffing his mouth full of straw to muffle the sound. Jeems kept watching, fascinated, and as they began to tire, one of the fairies said to the other, I say, Puck, I twet. Do you twet? Twet means sweat. Well, apparently that was it for Jeems. He was happy enough lurking in a hay bale, watching fairies do all his work for him, but he drew the line at them getting tired. So at that, Jeems jumped up from behind the straw and shouted, bits of chewed up hay falling from his mouth. I'll twet ye, you little rascals. What business have you got in my barn? The fairies, rather than answer him, simply picked up their tools and rushed past. They were perfectly happy to complete the threshing in the night, and they were looking forward to a kind farmer noticing their hard work and rewarding them with a nice bowl of cream or milk. But rudeness such as this would not be tolerated. As the fairy men ran past him, Jeems felt a sharp pain in his head, and he passed out. When he came to, he struggled to get back to his house. His wife, concerned about Jeems' weakened state, summoned the local doctor. But all was to no avail. It was too late. Jeems knew that no doctor could cure a fairy curse. Sure enough, he died the following year, and from his grave, snowdrops still grow. And that is where we're going to leave you for the first episode of our brand new podcast of Gods and Goblins. I hope you enjoyed it. This is our first attempt making a podcast, so I hope it was pleasant to listen to. 
Uh, we would love to hear your thoughts on any of our social medias. You can find us at Gods and Goblins on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. You can email us at godgobpod at gmail.com. And you should be able to listen to us on all the various podcasting apps and things. We should be on Spotify, we should be on the Apples, we should be on the Stitchers, hopefully. We'll also be on SoundCloud and on YouTube if you would prefer to listen there. We will see you again in two weeks time. This will be a fortnightly podcast, so keep an eye out for that. And until then, I hope you're having a great day. Goodbye from me, Heather Morehouse, and goodbye from you. Heather Morehouse. Don't say that. Kieran Hill. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Are you literally dipping your entire face in your water? I'm trying to see if I can pick it up with my mouth and drink from it. This is not the time to do that. You're going to drop it and spill it over my entire computer and I'm going to fucking lose my mind. I do hate Tolkien elves. They're Nazis. They're not Nazis. They're literally not. They're basically like Aryans. No, they're not. Who are the Nazis then? One of them are Nazis. The Orcs. Why are the Orcs Nazis? They're not Aryan. <laughs> Why are the Orcs Nazis? Please explain. Have you not seen Lord of the Rings? Or read it? I thought the elves were the Nazis. No! I thought I read it on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs>